Good uh, morning, afternoon, everybody. Um, I will sing a little bit the same tune, but with uh, some other things I will address in this uh, presentation, so it's not all repetition, and I hope I can keep you awake. So uh, Michael Papadakis, who organized the session, asked me to talk a little bit on uh, arrhythmias uh, in athletes, whether they are innocent bystanders or markers of athletic uh, heart disease, and I will address that question a little bit larger than just the ventricular uh, topics you have heard about. Uh, I have a number of potential conflicts of interest, but I think none of them relates to this presentation, so I'm free to speak here. Um, my answer to the question that the title raises uh, definitely is that arrhythmias in athletes never are innocent. And there's many reasons uh, to, to make that case. The first is that, um, of course, any arrhythmia can lead to symptoms. And these symptoms can be dizziness, these, they can even be uh, syncope or sudden death, as you've heard, and uh, they may pose a problem during sports, that's clear. Uh, that is obvious for ventricular arrhythmias. Um, we will see that this may also be the case for simpler arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation and flutter, because they can lead to a very fast ventricular response. And even in the case where there is a so-called benign type of paroxysmal palpitations, uh, even uh, when we think we document PSVT, um, we have to find out in an athlete more than in the regular population what is exactly the cause, what may be an underlying problem before we can say that this is just an innocent finding in the athlete. And so we will have to document the arrhythmia, explore the underlying heart disease, and assess, of course, the hemodynamic consequences. And I will back quickly to that in a couple of cases. The second thing uh, why arrhythmias cannot just be considered innocent in an athlete is that in many cases they are just a manifestation of a problem. An arrhythmia is not just there uh, by itself, usually it's the expression of something which is wrong. And that can be a channelopathy, that can be a simple accessory pathway, that can be a change in your heart muscle, a cardiomyopathy. But anyway, we have to try to find out. Not just, oh, this is an arrhythmia and we can treat it. No, we also have to think what is causing this arrhythmia because the effects and the consequences in athletes may be much more far-reaching than the arrhythmia itself. We know that physical activity, whatever is the underlying problem, increases the risk of developing arrhythmias and maybe even sudden death. And our chairman, uh, Domenico Corrado, has nicely shown that in an earlier paper, and so we have to take any arrhythmia serious, of course, when we find something with screening, but also when we hear that the patient or the athlete is having some symptoms, even if they're mild symptoms, we cannot be very clear, we have to zoom in on them because arrhythmias can be a problem, they are not just innocent, and I hope that sets the stage of my presentation. And so, when we look at athletes, we have to define, is it safe to participate if you have some arrhythmic problem? And uh, some of them may get to the line, some of them may not, and that could be a problem. A simple thing to start with, if you see this sort of ECG, you have seen it this morning, where you clearly recognize delta waves, and this is pre-excitation, even if the athlete is asymptomatic, and this is a finding in screening, this is a reason of concern. In the general population, usually, and especially in younger people like many of our young athletes, we will be a little bit uh, holding off. If the athlete has no symptoms, denies any palpitations, any presyncope or syncope, um, or if a normal individual denies that, then probably we wait and see. We will not immediately treat or further investigate such pre-excitation. In an athlete, however, you have to look into the conduction properties, and that requires uh, to be um, fair an electrophysiological study. So we need to be more aggressive in an athlete. Now, often you get athletes or you have a questionnaire and they write down some palpitations. And palpitations is a wide term. And you can zoom in a little bit more on that. And you can maybe think, well, this is paroxysmal, supraventricular tachycardia-like story. Um, is that something of concern? The athlete is performing well, never had problems during athletic activity, just some bouts of, of palpitations. And of course, you will look at the EKG, and if the ECG looks fine, you may say, okay, there is no pre-excitation, I let the, this athlete compete. 
Now, that may be, again, a good approach in normal population. In an athlete, however, we have to be a little bit more, again, alert and try to find out what may be underlying. And um, in fact, this athlete had pre-excitation. Just we were not seeing it. It is called latent pre-excitation. And this is due because you have a left-sided accessory pathway far away from the sinus node, and it's not showing up on a normal ECG. There is just no pre-excitation, despite that effect that there is anti-grade conduction. And in baseline, you do not see delta waves. But as soon as you slow down the AV node, and you can easily do that, especially in athletes, by carotid sinus massage, because they have a high vagal tone, or you can do it with adenosine injection, then you will see that by slowing down the AV node, now you unmask pre-excitation. And so this, in fact, was an athlete with palpitations, and not a normal ECG, but with pre-excitation. He has a WPW syndrome. Again, in an athlete, something we cannot accept. It's uh, uh, no reason to continue sports without treatment. So we have to deal with that because the problem is, is that if you have such an accessory pathway that conducts anti-gradely and you ever develop atrial fibrillation, and we heard already that athletes are more prone to developing atrial fibrillation for many, many reasons, even at a younger age because of high adrenergic tone, maybe an exceptional situation, but it can happen. Well, it can be life-threatening, of course, if you have pre-excitation, because it can lead to very, very fast ventricular rates and even degenerate into ventricular fibrillation and being a cause of sudden death. So again, in an athlete, we need to be more alert than in the general population. And an arrhythmia always is a matter of concern, always should be a reason to investigate more thoroughly than in a non-athlete. Let me go to another type of arrhythmia. We discussed it already, uh, atrial fibrillation, which you will not so often see, of course, in younger athletes, but uh, more and more in the 50s, uh, 50s and, and, and even sometimes in the 40 age uh, uh, group. This may show up during a routine visit. Maybe this is asymptomatic. Maybe there is some shortness of breath during exercise. It can be pocket symptomatic, that atrial fibrillation. And of course, you may say this may be related to the sports, or there may be other reasons. But should this be a concern in the uh, um, acceptance of sports participation itself? Because that's the decision you will have to make during that visit. Well, it should be a concern. Atrial fibrillation is a benign disease, again, in the general population. But in those that perform sports intensively, it may be a problem. And especially because some of these atrial fibrillation episodes intermittently may organize into atrial flutter, which is like a cousin, cousin of uh, atrial fibrillation. And this flutter during high adrenergic stress can lead to one-to-one -to -one conduction to the ventricles. And this can be, again, a life-threatening situation. They can have rates up to 250 beats or 300 beats per minute. This was from an ambulance uh, um, after an, one of, a colleague of mine was having a Sunday morning jogging and the last 200 meters he was accelerating to reach his car and he never got to his car. He collapsed and he was lucky he could crawl on his hand and foot uh, to the car where he found his GSM and he could alert the paramedics and this was the ECG they found. Now you can say, well, I can treat that, I can try to prevent it with drugs. I will not have the time to deal here with that, but it's very, very difficult and even dangerous to treat those patients with drugs. Do not give lecainai, do not give propafenon, because you will increase the propensity for this one-to-one -one conduction. It may look even worse than this, and they can die suddenly. So a simple arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation, even if it is symptomatic, can become a problem. And again, we should be more alert. It's not innocent in an athlete. That's the main theme of this presentation. And that's why in the recommendations that our sports cardiology group has produced many years ago, uh, we say that if you document atrial flutter, ablation is mandatory. There is no other choice. But even if you have atrial fibrillation, you should consider prophylactic flutter ablation because it may always occur and you will never be sure without ablation that this will never occur. And so that's why we strongly recommend it to consider flutter ablation when you see atrial fibrillation. Okay, sometimes you will not see atrial fibrillation, but you will see an ECG like this. Maybe the athlete uh, tells you that from time to time he feels a skip beat. 
As you can see on this tracing, there is many atrial extracystoles. I think I could count three at least. And uh, this is a pattern you also should be alerted uh, by a, a little bit because these are often ectopic beads coming from the pulmonary veins. They may be the precursor to atrial fibrillation. And again, atrial fibrillation is not an innocent problem in um, athletic people. And so again, this could for you be a reason to go for a halter, for instance, or a longer time ECG recording to find out whether there is maybe asymptomatic bouts of atrial fibrillation, again, which may be a problem. So no arrhythmia, even a simple atrial ectopic beat is just innocent. You have to think through and you have to think in the context. I will just spend one slide on channelopathies. It would, deal, uh, it, it would make it too complicated here to deal with them in detail. Uh, channelopathies, again, are an underlying problem that predisposes to arrhythmias that may be triggered by exercise. So often in those uh, uh, people, especially when they have symptoms, we will tell them to restrict on exercise. But the um, European recommendations at least go so far to say that even asymptomatic carriers should restrict on some exercise and not go into competitive exercise. There is some debate on that. But I just want to show you that we are, again, alert in those situations, uh, and, and especially when they want to go into vigorous and competitive exercise. The last part of my presentation continues on the previous uh, talks you have heard, and that is that arrhythmias in athletes are not innocent because um, they may be the indicator of an underlying problem, which is caused by the athletic activity itself. And we have heard about this athlete's heart, which should be a nice, balanced hypertrophy and dilated heart that uh, indeed can sustain those exercises. But as an electrophysiologist, when we look at such a heart which is dilated, which is slower, has a high vagal tone, and many changes of an athlete's heart, in fact, are changes that we expect will, by nature, predispose to rhythmias. And you have heard that maybe high-level Athletic activity may even do some harm structurally to the heart, which even increases this propensity for arrhythmias. So always when you look at an athlete, you have to be concerned that this athletic heart may be a heart that is an arrhythmic heart. And that's uh, the, the, the theme of my uh, uh, next part. We have heard about atrial fibrillation, and indeed there is many, many studies now, and it started by small case control studies indicating that there is more AF um, in athletes, that um, people with low AF know a clear uh, cause for their atrial fibrillation more often are um, uh, endurance sports people. And of course, there was a lot of critique on these smaller studies. But over the last two, three years, we have had a couple of very large, more epidemiological studies. And I've just uh, indicated one here, which is the Physician's Health Study. And they looked at almost 17,000 physicians over uh, a 12-year time span. And they asked them in a questionnaire to quantify the amount of exercise they did and how often they did uh, more vigorous activities per week. And they use different mathematical techniques to calculate the propensity for developing atrial fibrillation. That's the three colored bars here. It's the different techniques, but you see they all come to the same conclusion that by doing more and more vigorous activity per week, you increase your propensity for developing atrial fibrillation. There is a relationship there. And that's not surprising because many of the changes, again, as I said, that develop in an athlete's heart by themselves predispose to this arrhythmia, which is, again, not an innocent arrhythmia always in, in athletes. The same holds true, by the way, for flutter. I talked to you about flutter. We did a, a study looking at our lone flutter cases, patients that uh, were referred for ablation of atrial flutter, had no documented atrial fibrillation. The way they had no underlying heart disease, which was obvious, and we questioned them. And then you see again that more of these people do uh, regular sports or endurance sports than when you match them with a controlled population from our same region. So again, the same scheme as what you see with um, atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> 
Why do these things develop? As I mentioned to you, many of the changes in an athlete's heart predisposed to atrial fibrillation. What are these changes? And we have to credit uh, Matthias Wilhelm from Bern in, in Switzerland, who tried to at least elucidate and make hard some of the assumptions we had made uh, over a long time. And he, he did an original approach. He uh, looked at um, people that registered for a 10-mile race in Bern, more than 25,000 runners. He sent them an invitation to participate to a study, and he had uh, about 500 people who, con who said they were interested. He, uh, at random, uh, chose 70, a number of them disqualified for a number of reasons, and he kept a group of 60, which he investigated more in detail. And as you can see here, he found that in four of those 60, four of those 60 randomly sampled uh, people, 6.7%, they had at least had an episode of atrial fibrillation before that. So they had a history of atrial fibrillation. And if you look at the number of marathons that these participants, this was a 10-mile race, this was not a marathon race, but some of these runners, of course, also had participated to marathons. And he divided them in three groups, depending on the number of marathons they had ever run. And you can see that almost all the AF uh, cases came out of the group that was doing a lot of marathons uh, and, and much less uh, in, in the lower group. So again, there is some those effect relationship, so to say. And looking at the underlying mechanisms, we as rhythmologists, we always think in arrhythmias uh, uh, in the concept of the triangle of Kumel. Kumel was a French electrophysiologist who said to get an arrhythmia, you need a substrate, you need a, a trigger, something that starts it, and you have modulators, which most of the time is the autonomic nervous system. And Matthias looked at these three uh, uh, points of the triangle, and the substrate is there because they have larger atria those that develop atrial fibrillation. The triggers are there because they have more atrial premature beats, and the modulator is there because they have a higher vagal tone when you looked at heart rate variability uh, parameters. So it nicely fits the idea we had already for a long time, but he now uh, could, could show it in nice data that there is that relationship between a, a, an athlete heart and developing atrial fibrillation. Of course, we are more concerned even if we have ventricular problems, and Andre and uh, Sanjay already introduced this topic. We think that although exercise, of course, in most leads to a healthy remodeling, the athlete's heart that we all need to do those sports, that in some, and we don't know exactly why, there may be the development of a proarrhythmic state uh, which um, can be related to the development of microfibrosis, and we call it exercise-induced ARVC because it really has a phenotype which is very similar to ARVC. And Andrea already alluded to the fact that the right ventricle really is stressed during exercise. Um, in fact, it's a poor ventricle because the vent right ventricle has to follow pace with the left ventricle. When you are well-trained athletes, your left ventricle is very well-trained to push yourself to very high cardiac outputs. And the left ventricle can do it. It can easily hypertrophy. It has a lowering of uh, systemic vascular resistance. But the right ventricle has to pump the same cardiac output. And it's thin-walled. And it has a pulmonary vascular resistance, as you've seen, that does not adapt. You have a linear curve. The higher your cardiac output needs to go, the higher you need to make the pressure. So this is really a poor right ventricle. It's in a poor situation. And this is not adapted because you are athletic and because you are training. There is no change in your pulmonary circulation. And this may lead, as he's uh, indicated, to an arrhythmic substrate. And that's, in fact, how we started this whole research endeavor uh, over the last uh, almost 10 years. Because as a simple electrophysiologist, I was watching athletes that were referred to me in Leuven from all over the country in Belgium because they had mild symptoms, not apparently um, arrhythmic uh, at, the, at the very beginning, but we found out that they had arrhythmias uh, in the World Cup. And I was surprised to find arrhythmias that almost always were coming from the right ventricle. And honestly, I could not explain it. When I went into the textbooks in the literature, all the causes that were known, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, anomalies of the coronaries, you would always think it comes out of the ventricles where is the biggest mass, which is the left ventricle. Nevertheless, 80% came out of the right ventricle. So that did not make sense in a statistical 
way. And it was not a benign finding because I learned the hard way that in a f about five year follow-up time, 18 of those 46 that in the beginning I thought, well, this is a finding, but what does it mean? Well, 18 of them developed life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias, nine even dropped dead, and luckily some of them were resuscitated. But over the years I started, of course, wondering what is happening here. And maybe it is because they are athletes that they have these arrhythmias coming from the right ventricle. Of course, we have selected cases, and that's what Sanjay already alluded to. We have, of course, the, the, the real cases. We see one very end of the spectrum, and it's a very small proportion of athletes that develops this. And we can only make very rough estimates, but I would think it's about one in 100, maybe, of the elite uh, cyclists and, and, and other uh, endurance athletes. So it's a small, small proportion. But why, of course, do these people develop it? What are the facilitating factors? And uh, the question that always comes up, and today more than yesterday, uh, or the days before, is of course performance enhancing drugs. Nobody of us knows the real answer. We every day learn more about it. Um, honestly, I cannot say or rule out, but I don't think they are the direct cause. Because if they were the direct cause in the sense that they cause a cardiomyopathy directly and change the myocardium, again, you would expect it more to be from the left ventricle statistically than from the right ventricle. So I think the drugs may help, but indirectly, because they help you to train harder, to, to exercise harder, and to strain your RV harder. So it may indirectly contribute to it, but just the same way as um, hyperbaric uh, chambers may do. Is a genetic predisposition the, the explanation? Sanjay already alluded to that um, because we know that in ARVC, which is a familial disease, desmosomal mutations explain why you have that phenotype. And we know that phenotype is facilitated by exercising. So we thought, well, maybe they just have uh, mutations and they're visualized, they become apparent because they are athletes. So we did a very, very thorough study where we um, looked at 47 athletes with, again, these right ventricular arrhythmias, sequenced all five desmosomal genes, and also did some uh, other evaluation to rule out uh, deletions or insertions that you miss by direct sequencing. So we didn't want to miss any problem in those five desmosomal genes. And this is what we found. We found nine uh, uh, variants, genetic variants. Seven were novel, and in fact, five of those were considered pathogenic. Five in this series means about 13%. So indeed, some of these athletes had the phenotype because they had a mutation. We found it. But this is much less than the mutation rate you find when you combine all the studies on familial ARVC, even in the index probands, even when they have no family history. So if this was just unmasking of a latent mutation, then we would at least have come up with the 40%, maybe even more, and we had much less. So this, for us, told us it's not just a genetic predisposition, at least not in the desmosomes, and that's why we have started looking into the pulmonary circulation and got more and more interested in that, and I think the problem is lying not in the heart, but outside of the heart, maybe. And um, does that matter whether you have a mutation or not? Well, here you see the two groups those with the mutation, and we divided them according to the task force criteria. And you see the distribution for the task force criteria is exactly the same. Whether you have the phenotype with an underlying mutation or without the mutation, it doesn't matter. What matters is that those with the mutation develop the phenotype with much less exercise per week than those that develop the phenotype without the mutation. So if you have a mutation, indeed, you develop ARVC by exercise and more easily, but you can develop a similar phenotype without the mutation when you exercise more. And this led us to uh, the hypothesis that in fact we are seeing not two different entities, but maybe two parts of a spectrum. And Andre again alluded to how the right ventricle not only sees these higher pulmonary pressures, but also because it's uh, larger, because it has a thinner wall, all factors in the Laplace equation that explain that it sustains a much higher wall stress during exercise. And wall stress, what is wall stress? Wall stress is the pooling of the cells on each other. And this is sort of our unifying hypothesis. If you have mutations in the desmosomes, and you have weak desmosomes, 
then when you do normal exercise, you may pull some cells apart. Troponins leak, you get fiber fatty replacement and repair. At the end, you develop a phenotype of familial ARVC. But what we think, and it's an hypothesis, we will have to prove it, but we have some good arguments for this you've seen, is that even if you have normal desmosomes, but if you pull too hard because you're an exercising athlete and you have very high wall stress, you also pull them apart and you get a similar phenotype. So for us, it's two ends of a spectrum. It's not a contradiction. It's just a, a, a continuation, of, so to say, of uh, phenotypes. So what does that mean for you as a clinician looking at athletes and mainly screening athletes? Well, if you see a single ventricular premature beat on an ECG, what should you do? Well, you can accept it and say, well, there's no problem here in this screening ECG. If that athlete says that he's completely asymptomatic, there is no family history, you find no other changes on the ECG, very important to look at, no physical findings. But also, I would add, if it's not a high-level endurance athlete, because even a single PVC in a high-level endurance athlete can alert you to some underlying problem. You should pick it up. Again, you should be alerted. And you should say, well, is this an indication of something? Is it a chance finding? It may be, but maybe not. Because if you have one ECG with a single VPB and it's a pure chance finding, and you calculate, then you would have more than 8,000 VPBs over 24 hours. So you should take it seriously, especially in a high-level endurance athlete. If you are in high-level endurance activity, and at least when you have more than two VPBs, you should further evaluate. Why? Because we know that VPBs can be a finding an athlete without prognostic significance, provided you have all these factors. I have indicated them. And if you have any of those factors, you will restrict exercise. But ruling out underlying heart disease in an athlete is extremely difficult. And you have already heard how we interpret the ECG. You have heard how we look at MRIs. But not any e evaluation is watertight. And so before you can tell an exercising athlete, your VPB has no prognostic significance because you have no underlying heart disease, well, before you can make that statement, you have to sometimes do a really intensive workup. And I will not go into the details because nobody knows what is the real workup. But we think that often even electrophysiological study is important in the workup. We discussed this morning the, 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 the runner with his uh, uh, fibrosis in, in the heart. I would maybe do an EP study for what it's worth because we've shown that it was the only test we had at hand that could somehow predict prognosis. So we have to be concerned. So even if you have a right ventricular seemingly idiopathic ectopic beat, again, we should be more alerted in an athlete. We have some data that some of them have microstructural changes. We see that we want, when we want to ablate them, that it's not the focus. It's a whole region. It's like something is rotten in that right ventricular outflow tract. It's not the same in athletes as it is in other idiopathic RVOT. And also Domenico Corrado has shown that in some of these athletes presenting with right ventricular ectopic beats, if you look carefully with uh, electrophysiological means, that sometimes you see low voltage areas that are the only indicator that something is wrong with the wall and that there is some structural abnormalities that therefore may become prognostically important. So one ECG, I will quickly skip over this because we need to shorten up, uh, needs to evaluation, look at repolarization abnormalities, look maybe at late potentials. This can be ARVC, uh, familial or exercise induced, that then needs to be worked up. This is another lady, similar, number of ventricular ectopic beats, but she has no repolarization abnormalities, she has no late potentials. Maybe I would even stop here and say, well, this may be a real idiopathic RVOT, um, ectopic beats. What I'm telling here and what the others have told here, as Sanjay already alluded to, does not mean that you should stop people exercising. It's not because a tenniser may have a tennis elbow that we stop all people uh, playing tennis. No. We know that there may be a strain injury and that we have to deal with it when it happens. We have to open our eyes. And the same is true for the heart. We have to realize that there may be sports injuries also to the heart. Maybe atrial fibrillation, flutter, maybe ventricular arrhythmias. And definitely we have to learn more about 
what happens to the heart during exercise. We have very limited insight, and Andrea already alluded to our exercise MRI program. In fact, I want to invite you that if you ever have an athlete who has right ventricular arrhythmias, um, that we are happy to investigate that athlete. We have a two-day protocol. We can reimburse even the travel if you want, and of course, the, the stay in Leuven to have this uh, technique used, and hopefully we learn more about this uh, um, exercise and the heart. So that brings me to the end. Arrhythmias in athletes are never innocent bystanders. I hope I could convince you of that and that you take that message home. They can always herald dangerous situations, so we should carefully evaluate and assess the situation, and they may be markers themselves of underlying heart disease. I thank you very much.